Hello everyone, Dr. Data Science here to teach you data science methods and tools today, tomorrow, and beyond. In this video, we discuss how to formulate logistic and softmax regression, which are used for binary and multi-class classification problems. We also explain the cross entropy loss, which is widely used for classification problems. And then uh, later, we talk about how to implement logistic and softmax regression using PyTorch. So as you can see here, only, you only need a few lines of code to do to implement uh, these classifiers. But however, it is very important to understand how uh, these uh, steps work. If you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe to the Dr. Data Science team so you don't miss any future videos. So the first step is to understand the connection between linear and logistic regression. So let's say we have a problem where we have four input features in our input layer, and these are all connected to our output. And remember, in this case, our output, because it's a binary classification problem, it can only take two different values. And here we call this zero and one, but these are basically, they don't have any numerical value. So they can be just any two sort of like different numbers. So based on what we know from linear regression, we can assume that the output is a linear combination of the input features, meaning that we have these weights or parameters W1 to W4 and this bias term B. So we find this linear combination. And the problem here is that um, this output value here, Z, can be anywhere from negative infinity to infinity. And that's not what we want, right? We want to get only two labels. So what we're going to do is that we're going to take this output and pass it to the logistic or sigmoid function, which you can see here. As you can see here, this function, the output is always between zero and one. So when Z is really, really large, we get close to one. And when Z is very, very small, like we get a very, uh, so like a large negative number, it goes to zero. And right in the middle here is exactly 0.5. So the good thing about using this function is that now we can interpret this as a probability value. Because if you remember, probabilities are always between zero and one. And if you have a set of discrete events, the sum of probabilities should be equal to one. So now we can introduce the exact formula. So this logistic or sigmoid function is one over one plus exponential of negative C. And we have every right to multiply both numerator and denominator by exponential of z. And this way you can see that we get exponential of z over 1 plus exponential of z. So you can represent logistic or sigma function in both ways. Now we can look at closely how this works in terms of probabilities. So you can see that we have two discrete labels we assume that probability of y equals one is equals to this sigmoid function, sigmoid of z, which is exponential of z over one plus exponential of z. And then the probability of the other event, meaning that y equals zero, will be one minus probability of y equals one, which if you do the math, you get one over one plus exponential of z. And you can see that if we add these two probabilities, we get one plus exponential of z divided by one plus exponential of z, which gives us one. So this is how logistic regression works. Here, remember that we have only uh, a classification problem with two classes. So now the question is that what would happen if we have more than two classes? Let's say we have three classes. So like before you can have these four input features right and then now let's say we have the number of neurons in this output layer is exactly equal to the number of classes and we can write this in terms of linear combinations of inputs but you can see here for each w now we use two indices because one refers to which uh sort of like input feature we are multiplying this w2 and then um the other index is used for this z1, z2, z3, right? So you remember like here when we have z1, all the first indices are equal to one. And then the second index shows the sort of like the feature number. And similarly for z2, you can see that all the first indices are exactly two. 
So this is the key to be able to write these in terms of matrix multiplication, which is the key to the efficiency of neural networks and using GPUs, right? So we can have these metrics of weights, which is W, which is three by four, right? So three rows and four columns. And then we have X, which is four by one. And then we have three bias terms, right? And if you put in this into equation, we do this multiplication, we get these Z's that are three by one. But here again, we have the same problem, right? Because these Z values, they can be anywhere from negative infinity to infinity. So how can we convert this to probability? So we extend the idea of logistic, logistic function or sigma function into something that is called softmax function. So the way it works is that we take each of the values that we have for output, we find the exponential of that sort of like uh, value and then we divide this by the sum of all the exponentials. So if we do this for two reasons. First, when you take the exponential, if you remember from calculus, that's how exponential function looks like. So meaning that for any input, the exponential of x is always positive, right? So here, as you can see, then all of these values that we get here are positive. And then if we call these probabilities for these three different classes, zero, one, and two, we can see that the sum of probabilities will be equal to one, right? So because we get exponential of z1 plus exponential of z2 plus exponential of z3 divided by the same thing. So that's exactly one, right? So we can add these uh, three probabilities and we get one. So that's the why we use softmax, uh, softmax function, right? So we get these output values, which are linear combinations, and we plug them into this equation, and we get sort of like, you know, uh, estimates of probabilities that each sort of like sample belongs to um, these three classes that we have. So now let's talk about the cross entropy loss. So let's say we have a set of labels, and these are the labels that is in your training data, meaning that the ground truth or actual labels. And what we do here is that we represent them using this approach, which is called one-hot encoding. Meaning that if you have, let's say, three classes, you have three spots, and only one of them is one, which means that that sample belongs to that class, and then the remainder are all zeros. So and now in our model, we get these predictions, which are these probabilities that are output of the softmax, if you remember. And then we plug that into this equation, negative summation over classes of the actual labels, yj's, log of the probabilities. Something to keep in mind is that probabilities are always less than one. So log of that y hat j is negative. And what this means is that we have also that negative behind that summation, so they become positive. And that's the one thing that we, we have to make sure that we understand because loss functions should be positive or better say non-negative because if they are negative, then it doesn't make sense to minimize them, right? Um, so that's the cross entropy loss. Now the problem is that even in order to find that y hat j, we have that exponential function that we, we use. An exponential function, as the name suggests, the values grow exponentially, meaning that as we increase this x or the input, the value uh, increases exponentially. And then there are concerns about numerical stability when you plug in these values here. So let me show you in the next slide why this is not a problem. In order to explain this, we start with what we have in terms of the definition of the softmax function. And one thing also I want to say here is that these ZJs, if you remember, the one that we have pre-softmax layer are also called logits. So if you say logits, means that this is what we have before applying the softmax function. And when we have, let's say, three classes, we have uh, Z1, Z2, Z3, and we can find the maximum value. That's what I show here by Zmax. And again, I can multiply both numerator and de denominator by any number I want. So I multiply them by exponential of negative z max. And this would be the simplified form. So now, if you remember for that cross entropy loss, we have to find the log of the probability, which would be log of numerator over denominator. And remember from calculus that log of a over b is equals to log of a minus log of b. So this means that I can write this as log of the numerator, which is here, and then log of denominator, right? And then we have the negative sign in the middle. The other thing you need to 
uh, remember here is that log and exponential there are inverse functions meaning that if you apply them sequentially like this they cancel each other so that's why the result of this would be whatever we have inside this exponential function which is the zj which is the logit for the j neuron minus zmax minus the log of summation of exponentials and the nice thing is that this term can be computed very um, sort of like efficiently using some tools from scientific computing and then this part doesn't have any more exponential logarithm it's just what you get is this sort of like you know the logit value minus the maximum of them so this shows you like why computing that cross entropy loss is actually very straightforward now let's go through different steps to implement a neural network the first step you need a data set and here we're going to work with fashion mnist which is the extension of the uh the the standard mnist data set which is a handwritten digit classification so here we have these different uh types of clothing for example dress t-shirt and and so on and there are 10 classes so we want to be able to uh correctly predict these sort of like labels here in order to do so we are going to use one of the standard um sort of like data sets that is already inside uh torch vision which is for computer vision problems so we're going to import torch we're going to import torch vision from torch.utils, we import data, which has a lot of nice utility functions uh, to go through the data. Because remember, in neural networks, we don't want to have access to the entire data at once because we usually work with uh, very large data sets. So we want to have like iterate over different mini batches of data. And we can do this using this torch.utils uh, sort of like module. And then we also have transforms because in this case, we want to make sure that after we read the data, we use uh sort of like this two tensor to make these uh sort of like you know inputs to a tensor sort of like object because we want to use pytorch so we define this function that we only need to pass the batch size meaning that how many samples at each time we want to access and we use these transformations we can resize the image if we want and then we're gonna use torch vision that data sets to have access to these uh data sets uh for training we set train equal true for uh, testing we set train equals to false and this is the part that I mentioned that inside data which is part of torch.utils we can use data loader and what this does is that it, we can iterate over different mini batches so meaning that we can just read the entire data once by going uh, sort of from one batch to another batch and so on so we use this to just be able to read the data and here an example to see how this works so we use this function that we, we basically uh, just look at it and we said that now we want to have each byte size to be 32 and now we write a for loop that allows us to iterate over this sort of like training data and you can see this like in just like one of these like sort of like iterations that uh, we have this x dot shape which is 32 because we have 32 samples and each of them are 28 by 28 this one is equals to 1 because we only have one channel because we are not working with RGB images um to simplify this but you know for now you can just think of that as each input to be 28 by 28 and we can also look at the type which is the torch dot uh float so it's a floating uh sort of like uh the values inside this uh tensor and then you can see that we have 32 labels because obviously here we have 32 samples we look at both the training data or features uh and their corresponding sort of like labels which shows which class they belong to the next step is to define the model and that's where we use from torch import nn or neural network so this allows us to define what kind of network we want or what kind of architecture so we use a sequential model because we have different layers that are just put next to each other remember that each image is 28 by 28 and the first step is to what we call as flatten this image so meaning that we want to make sure that this is a one-dimensional sort of like array so now we have 28 by 28, which means that we have 784 elements, right? So that happens after using this flatten. And then we have 784 neurons that are connected to 10 neurons because we have 10 classes in the output um, layer. And the next step is to actually initialize the weights for this network, which we do this using the normal or the Gaussian distribution. And we have this function and now we can use net.apply to sort of like you know initialize the weights for this model 
The next step is to define the cost function and how you want to minimize it. So in order to find the uh, so like cost function or loss function, we are using the cross entropy loss. And as I always recommend you to go through the documentation, the official documentation of PyTorch and see how everything works out in terms of like options. And you already have seen this, the log of exponential over the sum of exponentials. And then, you know, here we just use the stochastic gradient descent, which means that we look at some data. Uh, we try to find the gradient and go the negative side, direction of the gradient. And this learning style rate, LR, shows that like, you know, how big each step is. And then here we also have to pass all the parameters that we have for network, which is this net dot parameters. So the last step is to put all together. So remember that we have the network, we have the loss function, we have the optimization technique. I'm also defining a sort of like a function accuracy to see that given the outputs of the network, how they compare with the actual labels. And here you can see that why we have this dot argmax access equals to one, because for each sample that you have, let's say 10 classes. So you have like 10 different values that, uh, that show like, you know, the probabilities that each sample belongs to each class. And now you want to look at the maximum of them, right? So because we are looking at the maximum in the sort of like direction of the rows of these metrics, that's, we call this access one, right? Because the output of our network would be N, which is the number of samples. And here we have the number of classes, which uh, we show this using Q, right? So we want to look at the output, uh, sort of like the maximum uh, output value in each row. And that's the axis equals to one. And then we just compare these using this sort of like conditional statement and just find the ratio of correctly classified points. As I said, whenever we go uh, through the data using this train iter, uh, we do this once. So usually in training neural networks and uh, deep learning models, we want to do this multiple times. So that's the number of epochs. So we have this outer for loop, which says for epoch in, for example, here range of three. So meaning that you want to repeat this process three times. And in each time you go through the, the, the entire data using this for loop. And the first step is to make predictions. So that's this step. And then you compare the predicted and actual values using the loss function. And now you have to use this trainer.0 grad because PyTorch by default accumulates gradients, meaning that like they put them together. But we want to make sure that the gradients are always like, you know, zero before actually like calculating them. So they are not like added together. And after that, use the loss function and dot backward. So uh, if you have watched the other videos, you know that when you use dot backward, this automatically finds all those partial derivatives for you. And then the last step is to just actually use one iteration of that stochastic gradient descent, which is trainer dot step, right? And remember trainer is defined here. And then after going through the data once each time, we can just uh, use that function accuracy that we have and compare and see how that uh, sort of like, you know, compares with the actual labels. And here we sort of like, you know, we print them, right? So for epoch one, two, and three, these are the accuracy values that um, that we get here. Obviously this network that we defined is a simple network. We didn't even like really use like hidden layers and so on. So the, the accuracy doesn't really here matter, but just the workflow that we have to take from reading data, defining network, loss function, training, now you can see how this works and now you can all add more sort of like customized functions as uh, necessary. I hope you found this video useful and see you next time.